Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Through Christ I pray. Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.
everyone, and welcome to Grace Point. My name is John, and I'm one of the ministry apprentices here at this church. I just want to extend a warm welcome to all of you here who are present with us, whether you are a regular, or maybe this might be your first time. We would just want to welcome you. I also want to give a shout out to those of you who are tuning into the live stream as well. Hello, hello. And if you want access to the bulletin in order to follow along with the service, it can be found at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash bulletin. And the sermon outline could also be found on the same website, gracepoint.org.au slash go slash sermon. Okay? Now, as we meet together here, we get together on the Lord's Day as a community to sing praises to Him in our hearts, to hear the preaching of God's Word, and to love and serve and care for one another with our gifts. And why do we do all this? We do all this because this is how God's people are meant to be worshipping God. It is an ingrained and integral part of what we do here at Grace Point and as believers in Christ. God is all deserving of praise and honor for he is the king who reigns over all creation. And all of creation testifies to the majesty and the power of our Lord. And Psalm 93 says this really well. So let me read the whole psalm for us. Okay? The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm, and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waves, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stay f stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. With that in mind, let us pray now to our Father in heaven, asking him to set our hearts and minds right as we come to him in worship. And so let's praise him for who he is as the almighty king who sits on the everlasting throne. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to ask you right now, as we come and worship you this Lord's day, that you would help us to praise you um, and worship you. For we know that we have sin in our hearts that reside in us and often clouds us from being able to see your glory. And so help us by your spirit to illumine our hearts and minds with the radiance of your truth today. And so pour out your spirit abundantly so that we may desire you in all majesty, beauty, and power, and the love that you have. And we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. I'm going to lead, um, sorry, I'm not going to lead. I'm going to invite our music team to lead us in song. Please stand and join us in um, singing praises to the Lord. When the music fades. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself, it's not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things are. You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about 
to know when the song ends, when there's no slides, so forgive me. Now it is time for confession of sin. We often see in Scripture that as people encounter God's presence, they sense how far short they've fallen. They become more aware of their finitude, of their own guilt, and of their own shame before this most holy God. God is so holy that by His very nature, He cannot stand to be with sin and to be with us. And yet God is not only holy, but He is also gracious and merciful as well. And so as a community here, but also silently as individuals, we make a profession of sin. Remembering that when we come to God, bringing nothing else to the table but our sin, by His grace, He forgives us. Confession of sin enables us to grow in our communion with God. And so I want to encourage everyone sitting right here right now, and also for those of you who are tuning into the live stream, to spend just a few quiet moments confessing your sin to God. And then I will bring us back together to read a unified prayer of the confession together. And you can find that prayer of confession of sin on the online bulletin at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash bulletin. I'll let you reflect and confess in silence. All right, let's come back together and let's read the confession of sin together. should be on the bulletins if you have your phones on you. This is what it says. Most merciful God, we humbly accept that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way. We have done wrong and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That we may live as disciples of Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our King and Redeemer. Amen. Now, this is what the Scripture says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins... He is faithful and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. That's a promise that is given to us. Isn't that awesome? And so let's receive the grace of God through the hearing of this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And this is what it says. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so in that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And it is natural for us to respond to the grace and kindness of our Lord Jesus by giving thanks to him for what he has done. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says this really well. It says, Let the peace of Christ ruin your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and to be thankful. So join with me in prayer as we respond to God's grace in a prayer of thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for how good you've been to us. And may we find spiritual tranquility in our hearts, knowing that on the cross you have made peace with us. And may we learn to make peace with others within our community here, so that you may, we may grow together in unity by the Spirit as one body who belongs to you. And I pray this in your Son's precious name. Amen. Now it is a time for congregational prayer. Here at Grace Point, we believe that prayer is the means by which we humbly come to God, asking Him for His strength in everything that we do, acknowledging His provision and His goodness in our lives, and also confessing our sins to Him, asking Him to change our attitudes and behaviors. And through prayer, we find rest for our aching souls when we come before the Lord. This is what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 11. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm going to invite Justin up, and he will be leading us in prayer. Hi everyone, I'm Justin, and I have the privilege of leading us in congregational prayer this Sunday. Please join with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how foolish is it for us to live and speak as though we have the wisdom and understanding that you do. You created and care for every living creature on earth, granting them what they need so that they might live and be testimonies of your wisdom and glory. For you know where the mountain goats give birth. You make the donkey run free and give it the plains as its home. You give the horse its strength and clothe its neck with a beautiful mane. By your understanding and providence, hawks soar, eagles make their nests up high, lions hunt, ravens are fed, sheep have shepherds, and we have everything necessary for survival. Who can compare to such wisdom? Lord, though we are allowed to approach you, we admit and repent of our sins. We do not deny our guilt, and we confess our wickedness and earnestly plead for your forgiveness. Help us to place ourselves always under your guiding and guardian care, to take a firmer hold of the sure covenant that binds us to you. Help us to feel more of the purifying and dignifying softening influence of the faith we profess, to have more compassion, love, pity, courtesy, to regard it an honor to be working for you as an instrument of your redeeming hands, to be ready to seize every opportunity of usefulness and be willing to offer all of our talents to your service. For you have wiped away our every tear and restored peace to the mourning and broken hearts. Father, we also want to thank you for the grace that you lavish upon us, both seen and unseen. Give us grace to see your grace, for we pursue after riches, not knowing that we have the whole world through Christ. We pursue relationships, not fully grasping our priceless relationship with you. We pursue the pleasures of this world to feed our minds and our stomachs, not knowing that the soul's starvation is a much greater one with eternal consequences. Had we pursued you with the zeal that we do with some of these transient things, we would surely be more godly men and women. Yet by your grace, you still provide for us these things. And so thank you, Lord, for the food we eat and the clothes we wear, for the health that we do have, for our neighbors that we can love and serve, for the restrictions that are ease so that we can gather in person. But above all, thank you for Christ and his saving work. Thank you that he took the initiative and had the humility to come down to earth amongst us sinners and die the death we should have died. Thank you that you were committed to saving us so that in Christ being God, we see your mercy and justice perfectly manifested. For forgiveness must be with the shedding of blood and so you became flesh through Christ, so that pure and acceptable blood could be provided. Finally, we pray for the maturity in our ministries and personal lives here at Grace Point. Lord, we do not always know the trials you ordain for our fellow brothers and sisters, nor do we claim to have felt the heat of the refining fires others have been through. But we pray that in everything, may you help us desire steadfastness in our faith, over the quenching of fires or removal of thorns, for your grace is indeed sufficient. May we also mature in our godliness to grow in obedience to what is good and to become more like Christ. We admit that godliness with contentment is great gain. So help us not just to be more pure, truthful and selfless, but to enjoy purity, truth and self-sacrifice, to see the beauty in abstaining from sin and obeying the cosmic ruler of the universe. Please also provide wisdom to Pastor Yuge and the other leaders who oversee maturity in our congregations. We ask that you help us cultivate maturity in the various ministries that are starting up again this year. 
whether it's maturity in our discipleships, our CGs, our men's and women's ministries, our church retreats, theology conferences, family or marriage enrichments, and whatever else we come across this year. Make us more mature men and women, but also make us more mature Christians. We pray and ask all of this in your son's most holy name. Amen. It is catechism time. And so for those of you who are not aware of what a catechism is, the word catechize simply means to teach biblical truth in an orderly way. And catechisms are typically structured in a question and answer format. And starting this week, actually, we are starting a new set of catechisms called the New City Catechism. It is a great resource that you can use to teach yourselves um, the core teachings of the Christian faith. And also for you parents out there, if you also want to teach your kids the basic fundamental truths of the Christian faith, you can also use this resource. You can download the app on your mobile devices. And guess what? It is free. Praise God for free things, right? And so today's catechism comes from the New City Catechism, question number one. And this is what it has to say. Okay, question. What is our only hope in life and death? Answer, that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. So this answer here actually comes directly from Romans chapter 14, verses 7 to 8. When Jesus died and resurrected from the grave, he was given authority over all things, things on heaven and things on earth as well. He is king and lord over all. Everything belongs to him, including us. And so our lives are not our own. Whether we live or die, everything we do as servants, we do for the Lord. And so church, let me ask you the question and you can respond by reading the answer aloud with me. And it should be in your bulletins if you can have a look in your devices there. So question, what is our only hope in life and death? That we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we come to the time of Bible reading. We read God's Word together because God has revealed Himself to us as His people by the Word. God sent His Word to us so that we might know who He is for our good and for our joy and for His praise and for His glory. And so let's hear from what God has to say and let's ask God to have us uh, have open hearts ready to receive and to be nourished with with what he has to give to us. And so I'm going to invite Josh to read the Bible for us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Chung, and I have the privilege of uh, leading us in Bible reading today. Today's Bible passage comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 31 to 37, and Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Hear the word of the Lord. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as had needed. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field of the land he owned and brought the money and put it, put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge, he kept part of the money for himself, uh, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before the land was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. 
Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down to, hit, to her feet and died. Then the young man came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. Let me uh, encourage you uh, to have your Bibles open uh, to the book of Acts, uh, chapter 4. There is an outline at uh, gracepoint.org.au slash go slash bulletin or slash sermon, depending on what you like. Some people like PDF, others are happy to take notes uh, on the U version. Uh, let me pray for us. Father, we uh, do pray and ask that as we open up the Bible this Lord's Day, that you might strengthen and encourage us. You might do your good work of calling, conviction, and conversion. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, uh, we are coming back to the book of Acts. Uh, we took a break last year uh, because of COVID. Uh, so over the next few months, really up to May, uh, we'll come back and we'll look at the book of Acts. It's a terrific book because it gives us an insight into the life of the early church. It gives us an insight into the birth of the first church, how it grew, uh, how it crossed cultures, and how it met opposition. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I know you're at chapter 4. If you look at chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8 sums up really the storyline of the book of Acts, which is what we're going to follow all the way to chapter 18, not today, but over the next few months. And notice in chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to, to his disciples before he leaves them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what follows in the book of Acts, uh, this is such a key verse, because what follows in the book of Acts is really the outworking of chapter 1, verse 8. The ongoing story of how the witness to the Lord Jesus, the proclamation of his saving work, goes out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the very ends of the earth. The story of the start and the growth of the early church as the good news of Jesus goes out, as the news of his saving work is proclaimed. And it moves out in concentric circles in the book of Acts, across cultures, into cultures, gathering new groups of people to form the church. Now, the book is open-ended because when you get to the end of the book of Acts, Paul is actually proclaiming the good news of Jesus in the great city of Rome. Uh, he is literally at the ends of the earth. That's what we meant to see in the book of Acts. The gospel or the good news of Jesus is going out. It's saving people into new communities of faith. Uh, the, the church is being birthed city to city as the gospel goes out. And what we meant to see is that God's mission is unstoppable. Nothing will stop the mission of God. Now, that's the macro, right? That's the bird's eye view of the book of Acts. That's what it's about. What we're going to do now is we're going to start, uh, as the weeks go by, we're going to narrow down. We're going to take a micro look. We're going to come down to ground level, and we're going to look at the individual chapters. And, we'll, and today, we're going to start at chapter 5. So come with me to chapter 4 and chapter 5, 4 verse 31 first. But chapter 5, uh, as you heard Josh read the Bible you would have realized, because it's so familiar to many of us, it's probably the most well-known passage in the book of Acts. Everyone knows the story of Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira, however you pronounce that. And, and we all know the story of Ananias and Sapphira because it's so shocking, it's so, it's so dreadful, uh, and we remember it, right? It's horrible. They lied to the apostles, and then boom, they dropped dead. Right? Even Sunday school kids remember it. Right? I remember it uh, being taught this in Sunday school. And chapter 5 is actually there for a reason. Okay? Let me give the reason for you, uh, to you up front. Okay? This is the reason why it's there. In chapter 4, the previous chapter, you have the start of opposition to the gospel. There is imprisonment and intimidation from the outside. There's an attempt to disrupt and destroy God's mission from the outside. 
Now that's going to get worse as the book of Acts actually unfolds. In chapter 5, you do have opposition as well, but the opposition now comes from within the church. Opposition to the gospel within. It's an act of deception and duplicity. Uh, an attempt to disrupt and destroy God's people from within. So chapter 4, opposition from outside. Chapter 5, opposition from within. And you discover that God's mission will not be stopped. And we're going to look at what we can learn from this, I think, quite shocking and dreadful story. Okay? Now, before we get to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, I want to look at where we are at the end of chapter 4, which is why Josh read for us verse 31 to the end of chapter 4. It gives us a glimpse into the life of the early church. Okay, what, what, what was life like in this first church community? It's an account of what, what, it, what it's like. The good before the bad in chapter 5. The calm before the storm of chapter 5. The beauty of the truth before the ugliness of deception in chapter 5. So have a look at verse 31 to 37 of chapter 4. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything, but I want you to notice there are four things there because we're presented with a very attractive and a very beautiful picture of the early church. Uh, it's a picture of the fruit of the gospel in the lives of the first church community. Notice very briefly, it's marked by four things, right? The first one, verse 31, it's a community that's incredibly dependent on God in prayer, filled with the Spirit of God. You see there, verse 31? They're praying, seeking God's help to be bold in making Jesus known, and God fills them with His Spirit. Second thing, they're a community. Notice verse 32. They are united in heart and mind around Jesus and His saving work. All the believers were one in heart and mind. You see there? That's the second thing. Third thing, uh, verse 31 and verse 33. They're a community that are boldly making the Lord Jesus known, boldly witnessing to the gospel. Verse 31, they spoke the word of God boldly. Verse 33, with great power. The apostles continued to testify, to witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, here's the fourth thing. Comes to us in verse 33. And God's grace was so powerfully at work among them. You see there, verse 31, 33? So powerfully at work among them, the grace of God, that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Uh, you want to know what the first church community was like, what a gospel community looks like? Well, here it is. This is what a grace-filled community looks like. It's marked by prayerful dependence, unity around the gospel, bold witness to the Lord Jesus. But notice it's also marked by that fourth thing, overflowing generosity. Can you see that? One of the dominant marks of grace received is grace that is poured out to meet the needs of others. And so you read these amazing words, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And then you read verse 33, grace was so powerfully at work in them all, in them all, that there was no needy person among them in the church. Isn't that amazing? Now, let me tell you why this is so radically countercultural, uh, not just in the world of the early church, but also in our world today. Uh, let me tell you up front, let me say up front, that we often assume that care for the weak, right, care for the vulnerable is self evident, it's normal. We often assume that compassion for the poor, justice for the weak is self evident. Well, it's not. It's not what everyone should do. In fact, historically, it's not what everyone has done. And that's actually a failure to understand history. Historian Tom Holland, not Spider-Man, uh, he actually writes, there's a guy called Tom Holland who's also a historian, he's not a Christian. Uh, he writes in his book Dominion, uh, a book on how we assume, uh, people today assume that many things are self-evident, human rights, justice, mercy, and he actually says historically it's not self-evident. In fact, it's a uniquely Christian thing. Uh, so even secular people who think that justice and mercy, care for the weak, uh, compassion for the poor, who assume that is a human right, uh, it's, it's, it's because they've been thoroughly Christianized. They have not understood history. So historian Tom Holland writes, the heroes of the Greeks scorned the weak and the downtrodden. So did the philosophers, that is the intellectuals of the day. The starving deserve no sympathy. Beggars were best rounded up and deported. Pity risk undermining the wise man's self-control because you, you're controlled by your emotions as opposed to your mind. There was little in the character of the Greek gods or in the teaching of the philosophers. Uh, 
to justify any assumption that the poor, just by virtue of their poverty, had a right to be loved or cared for or aided or served. There was no such thing as human rights in the Greek-speaking world, um, certainly not even in the world of the Middle Ages or the 10th century uh, or the 12th, 13th, 14th century. The weak deserve to die, effectively. The strong are celebrated. The disabled deserve to die. The healthy deserve to live. The poor uh, are there to st- uh, the poor are there to serve the rich. Children and women are treated like property. And if you want to know what a world without God looks like, if you want to see what a pragmatic, secular worldview looks like, well, you only have to read history. And so this is what historian Rodney Clark, another guy, another historian, writes about one of the reasons why the Christian faith was so disruptive but also attractive in the Greek-speaking world. Uh, it was both disruptive but also attractive. Because where you found Christian people, this is what you found. You found people who would often do good in society. This is what he writes. Christians would nurse the sick even during epidemics, support orphans, widows, the elderly, and the poor, concerning themselves with a lot of the slaves, the weak, and the marginalized. In short, Christians created a miniature welfare state in an empire which, for the most part, lacked social services. And, and that's what you're beginning to see here in the first church. It's the start of a radical counter-cultural welfare system that simply did not exist, that we today assume is normal when it's not. And so verse 32, these are radical verses. They shared everything they had. Uh, Verse 34, there was no needy person among them. Disruptive, but also attractive. In fact, when the Roman Emperor Julian, uh, he, in 362, he launched a campaign to revive the worship of the Roman gods, the worship of the emperor. Uh, and when he did that in 362, he recognized to do so, it would be necessary to match the compassion and the benevolence of the Christian church. Uh, he writes to a prominent uh, pagan priest, and this is what Julian writes. He writes to this pagan priest and he says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected, and overlooked by the priests, the impious Christians observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence, compassion. They, he says, they support not only their poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that people lack aid from us. That's the start of welfare, right? But what we read here is also radically countercultural for a second reason. Okay? Look at verse 34 and verse 35. Uh, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought them the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, this is the second reason why it was so countercultural. Giving money, right, benefaction, patronage, is normal. It's not just normal in our world, it's also normal uh, in the Greek speaking world. But what's so radical about verse 34, verse 35, is that it was given freely, with no strings attached, without expecting any favors back. Now, let me tell you the way patronage or benefaction work, not just in the New Testament world, but it works in our world as well today. Um, Wealthy people donate. They bequest so that they can be recognized, so so that they can be given social position. And some people donate so that they can have influence, okay? And so you'll notice, uh, if you go to Sydney University, uh, many of the halls or lecture rooms, actually not just Sydney University, all our universities, you go to any university and you notice that the halls and the rooms, um, they're actually named after people. Now, some of them are named after great academics, okay? The Isaac Newton Theatre. Yeah, I can understand that, right? He's contributed academically. But some of them are actually named after people. The Joshua Chung Hall of Music, not that there's such a thing, I'm just, but you know, notice Josh, I'm just using Josh as an example. But you have those sorts of names, the John Smith School of Drama. Why are their names there? Because they've donated large sums of money, right? Wealthy benefaction, and they get recognized. Now, you go to the Museum of Contemporary Arts, and in the foyer, if you've never realized, you also see this, this wooden board. And it's got the names, really, of all the patrons and benefactors. How do you get your name up on the board? You donate. People donate lots of money to be patrons of the MCA. Many years ago, well over a decade, 
when we were trying to secure a building uh, for our ministries here at Grace Point, one very wealthy owner of a property we were looking at, not this property, offered to knock off 700000 if we were willing to have his name recognized in some way on the church building. Compare that with another very wealthy supporter who actually gave us 500000 to help us secure this property for our ministries, who did not even want to be known, who didn't even want to be known by anyone in this church. In fact, there's probably only three or four people in this church who know who the donor was, who didn't want her gift disclosed to anyone. What a contrast, what a difference. The world says, give big to be recognized, right? To secure standing and position and social uh, influence, to have social influence. The gospel says, give big because Jesus has given you everything. That's the contrast, okay? That's why verse 33 to 35 is so countercultural, disruptive, but also attractive. Notice how the power of God's grace is at work in this new church community. There was no needy person among them because people gave generously. They gave freely to meet their needs. You see, the gospel says in Jesus, you have been given far more than you will ever give away in your life. You have been made far richer than any material wealth or position uh, or possession that you could ever possess. And so you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Paul says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So overflow in generosity. It's one of the marks of grace. This is grace. He became poor so that you might know the riches of the gospel. So it's no surprise that where the grace of the gospel has landed in someone's life, it overflows into grace, generosity. The hands that once held so tightly onto wealth now holds it loosely because it possesses something far richer in the gospel. Now, what a wonderful start to this new church community, right? Come back to this passage. It's prayerfully dependent and spirit-filled. It's united in heart and mind around the Lord Jesus. It's boldly making the Lord Jesus known. It's overflowing in generosity, practically meeting needs. And so chapter 4 ends in verse 36, verse 37. Look at verse 36, verse 37. And we're introduced to one such individual, one individual called Barnabas, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, someone in whom the grace of God is powerfully at work. And so look at verse 36, 37 with me. An example of someone who is living out verse 34 and verse 35. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Why? Because his name meant son of encouragement, someone who declares and speaks words of encouragement. He sold the field he owned. He brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. His name is Barnabas. And what an encouragement he is, isn't he, to the church community. Notice what the grace of God compels him to do. Grace received cannot be contained. It overflows. And you see there in verse 37, he does three things. He sold a piece of land he owned. He brought the money from the sale. He placed it at the apostles' feet to be distributed to needy believers. What an encouragement. This is what it means to be spirit-filled. This is what the power of grace does. This is a model of gospel grace. A model of gospel generosity. It is a model to encourage the believers in the first church in Jerusalem. Beautiful picture, attractive picture, a model of gospel grace. And when you get to chapter 5, now move to chapter 5 with me. As we move into chapter 5, you expect better things. You expect greater things. More encouraging things to follow. And I tell you why, because if you hadn't read verse 2, you read verse 1 and you expect great things. Notice how chapter 5, verse 1 begins. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. You had Barnabas, now you have Ananias. And you know Ananias, his, his name means God is gracious. What an irony. And his, his wife Sapphira, her name means beautiful. And so what you're expecting is grace upon grace, generosity upon generosity. You expect something beautiful. And what follows is the bad, the ugly the unattractive, you witness grace denied, right? Greed in place of generosity, deception in place of truth, 
And so look again at verse 1 and verse 2. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. How wonderful. You expect the same things. But notice what you read. Verse 1, he sold a piece of property. Now verse 2, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. He put aside some of the proceeds from the sale for himself. He brought the rest, put it at the apostles' feet. Can you see what he's doing? He's keeping back part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. So uh, from the perspective of people who are watching, because it's probably a public setting, uh, from the perspective of people who are watching, it appears and it looks like he's just like Barnabas. The grace of God is powerfully working in his life. It looks like he looks like Barnabas. He's doing exactly the same thing. But you and I know when we read this story, you and I can see that there is a difference, isn't there? In fact, Ananias, whose name means God is gracious, is a contradiction, isn't he? His actions... His actions look nothing like the overflowing grace of God. There is nothing gracious about what he's doing. And Sapphira, whose name means beautiful, like her husband, there's nothing beautiful in this act of generosity. Now, let me say up front, look at verse 3 and verse 4, the deception. Let me say up front, the issue is not that he kept back some of the proceeds of the sale from his land. It's not like there was a law in the early church, right, that said, if you sold property, you've got to give it all to ministry. There, were, there was no such law. The problem you discover is Ananias' deception in pretending to be generous. His duplicity in making it appear that he was being generous. And so look at verse 3 and verse 4, what follows. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And have kept for yourself some of the money you, you received from the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And so what you discover now is Peter actually confronts Ananias. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? How is it that you would have lied to the Holy Spirit? How is it that you would keep for yourself some of the money you received from the land? And verse 4 tells us what he's done wrong. The property belonged to Ananias before it was sold. The money he got from it was at his dis disposal. So what made you think of doing such a thing? See the question there? Doing what? What did Ananias do so wrong? Look at verse 4. He lied. Not just to the apostles, he lied to God. He sought to deceive not just the apostles and the church community. Peter says... His apparent generous act in this church community was an attempt to deceive God. You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, poor Ananias, yeah, I feel sorry for him. He wasn't even given a chance to repent. But look at verse 3 and verse 4 very carefully. You notice Peter has been giving him opportunities to repent, to fess up, to acknowledge his deception. In our English translations of the Bible, uh, Peter confronts Ananias with four questions. But there are two implied questions there as well. There are actually six questions being asked of Ananias. Why did Satan fill your heart? Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you keep back part of the proceeds? Why did you not see you had, a right, you had right ownership? Why did you not expect control over the proceeds? Why do you decide to do such a thing? Why, Ananias? Six opportunities to repent, to acknowledge his sin to confess deception, to seek forgiveness. But we met with a stone wall of silence. That's what we met with. There's no indication of remorse or guilt. Now, understand the nature of his deception. Very important to understand the nature of his deception. Um, think with me, those of you who have been on the receiving end of people who've deceived you, people who've cheated you, um, people who set out to deceive others do so because they think they'll gain something, don't they? Uh, they're going to get something out of their deception. Uh, when someone lies to you, uh, it's to cover up something, but it's really for their own benefit or personal gain. Okay? Now, deception, understand that deception isn't just speaking untruth, but also withholding, withholding truth so that self has some advantage. Uh, deception isn't just lying, but withholding truth for personal gain. That's the nature of deception. So what was Ananias hoping to gain? Maybe he was hoping to gain standing in the first church. Maybe he wanted praise from the church community, right? Uh, maybe he wanted respect and position in the church community. Or maybe he just wanted power and influence. Now, we will see that later. 
uh, in Simon Magus the magician uh, in the book of Acts as that unfolds. Or maybe he was try, just trying to look impressive before the apostles in the new church community. Okay? Now, I want to say three things about his deception is there in your outline, is there in your notes. Uh, here's the first thing. Number one, Ananias' action was not an act of self-sacrifice, but an attempt at self-promotion. Not an act of selfless generosity, but an attempt at self-promotion. Peter says it's not motivated by the Holy Spirit, but by Satan. And we know from John 8, that Satan is called the father of lies and deception. So he allowed his heart to be captured by the desire for self-glory, and that's why he lied and he deceived. He desired the praises of men and women at the expense of truth. It wasn't an act of self-sacrifice, but an attempt at self-promotion. Okay? And in the storyline of the wonderful beginning of this first church, look at the difference between the spirit-filled believers of chapter 4, verse 31, they're spirit-filled, dependent on God, overflowing grace, and compare that with Ananias here, who is filled with Satan's influence, the father of lies. In fact, Ananias' thinking was probably more shaped by the secular reasoning of his culture, patronage, benefaction, to gain some sort of influence or standing. And it's not an uncommon thing, is it? Not an uncommon thing. So church, here's the first thing I want you to understand. Religious devotion that seeks the praises of man comes from the father of lies and deception. It does not come from the Spirit of God. Ministry done that seeks the praises of people is deception, is deceptive. Godliness that li that's lived out, that seeks, to be, that seeks to impress the people around you, is deception. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. His lying to the apostles and the church was an attempt to lie to the Spirit of God. It was an attempt to deceive God himself. His lying to others around him was an attempt to lie to God himself. Notice what verse 3 and verse 4 says. In lying to the apostles, in lying to God's people about the money he received from the sale of his property, in pretending to be generous, Peter says, Ananias, you have lied to the Spirit of God, God's presence in the church community. Uh, some of you are familiar with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 to 22. If you have your Bibles, you could look at that. Uh, but it's there in your notes as well. But in Ephesians 2, verse 21 and 22, uh, the church community, this church community, this gathering is described in this way. The people of God uh, are described as the dwelling place of God, the place where God lives by His Spirit. And so to lie to the people of God is to lie to the Spirit of God. To attempt to deceive the people of God is an attempt to deceive God's Spirit. Now, I don't know whether you realize it. Has it ever occurred to you that how you treat the body of Christ, that is the people around you, has direct correspondence to how you're treating God Himself? Has it ever occurred to you? Let me say that again. Has it ever occurred to you that how you treat the body of Christ has direct correspondence to how you're treating God Himself? Remember what, uh, what was said to Paul. Paul, who persecuted the early church. We'll, meet, we'll find that later uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul persecuted Christian believers, the body of Christ. And when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, Acts 9, 4, and Acts 22, verse 7, when he tells the story of his conversion, Paul actually says, Jesus said to me, Saul, Saul, why did you persecute me? To persecute the people of God is to persecute Jesus and he's to, to is an attempt to oppose God himself or read with me and this one is a great one 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 to 17 if you have your Bibles I want you to go there 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 to verse 17 uh, it's one that we often overlook but look at what Paul says about the church he says the church is God's temple where God by his spirit dwells in each of his people it's not you personally but us he says God's Spirit dwells. Let me read that to you. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst, Corinthian church, Grace Point Church? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. That is, God's temple is holy, set apart for Him, and you together are that temple. You see there? If anyone destroys God's temple, God's people, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, holy to Him, and you together, 
You, church, are that temple where God dwells by His Spirit. How you treat the people of God corresponds directly to how you're treating God Himself because His Spirit is present in the lives of His people. How you treat the body of Christ matters. Have you ever realized that? How you treat each other in church community matters. To treat believers in a church community with contempt is to treat God with contempt. Uh, to, to take advantage of other believers in a church community is to, t- is to attempt to take advantage of God's Spirit. To slander other people in church community is to slander the Spirit of God. To deceive others in a church community is an attempt to deceive God. So look again at verse 4, Acts chapter 5. Peter makes it clear, in lying to the apostles and the church community, Ananias lied ultimately to God himself. You have not lied just to human beings. No, 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 Ananias. You have lied to God. That's not an uncommon thing. Uh, We know in other parts of the Bible, like Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 3 and 4. The Psalm, uh, David, in speaking of his sin, David, in speaking of his adultery with Bathsheba, this is what he writes. He says, For I know my transgression, I know my sin. And it's always before me because David's aware that he's a sinner. And then he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He sinned against Bathsheba, and in doing that, he sinned against God. Church, understand this. How you treat the body of Christ matters. How you treat God's people in community matters. How you relate to your brothers and sisters in your church community matters. To deceive God's people is to deceive God. To sin against them is actually to sin against God. But here's the third thing, the nature of his deception. Ananias, number three, was personally responsible for his own sin. Look at verse four. Look at what Peter did. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Ananias, you had the right of ownership. It was yours to do, to choose to do freely with it. You didn't have to give it all. You could have chosen to only give it a portion, right? Donating the money was not compulsory. There was no law that said you had to give everything. There was no rule that said if you sell your property, you have to give it all to ministry. No, no, no. There was no law. In fact, you could have chosen to donate nothing, and it would have been fine. Or you you could have chosen to donate a portion, and that would have been fine. But what does he do? He set out to deceive the apostles and the church community. And so at the end... Verse 4, we read, Ananias, what made you, you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. It's Peter's way of saying, Ananias, there's no excuse for your sin. Ananias, you are personally responsible for this action. He's personally responsible for his own deception. Yes, Satan might have influenced you, might have planted the thought in your heart and your mind, but Ananias, you acted on it, you schemed, you planned, you conspired, and then you deceived. You're personally responsible. And so church, I want you to understand this. You are personally responsible for your own sins. Notice that even though Satan influenced Ananias, Ananias was personally responsible for his own actions. In one of his books, uh, pastor and author John MacArthur writes on this topic of uh, personal responsibility for sin. And he explores the the change in our society's view on sin, right? Uh, The book was written about 20 years ago. Uh, It's aptly titled, The Vanishing Conscience, Drawing the Line in a No-Fault, Guilt-Free World. And in the book he writes, we live in a culture and society where we're told that guilt is a bad thing. Psychologists tell us that it's wrong to make people feel guilty. Uh, We're told that we're now victims, right? It's not your fault. You've been wrong. It's your circumstances that have made you what you are. You shouldn't feel guilty or bad when you do deceitful, hurtful, or selfish things. Think of yourself as a good person. And that kind of thinking has, per, has pervaded and influenced our world, even the church. Why? Because sin and personal responsibility for sin has been not just taken out of the public agenda, but out of church as well. Because people are now victims, and we see ourselves as victims. And so culture says, if you do something wrong, it's not your fault. You are a victim. 
In fact, you can escape responsibility always by claiming to be a victim. There's always a reason why it's not my fault. It's my background. It's my circumstances. It's my parents. It's my hunger. I was you know, hungry, and so I responded a certain way. It's my culture. That's why I act a certain way. We even blame others for our bad behavior. It reminds me of a poem by Anne Russell that goes something like this. I went to my psychiatrist to be psychoanalyzed, to find out why I killed the cat and blacked my husband's eye. He laid me down on a downy couch to see what he could find, and here's what he dredged up from my subconscious mind. When I was one, my mummy hid my dolly in a trunk, and it follows naturally that I'm always drunk. When I was two, I saw my father kiss the maid one day, and that is why I suffer from kleptomania. At three, I had a feeling of ambivalence towards my brothers, and so it follows naturally I poison all my lovers. But I'm happy now I have learned the lesson this has taught. Everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. That's how culture and society thinks. And unfortunately, many of us in the church think that way. The title of a poem is Someone Else's Fault. Church, can I say this to you? The Bible teaches us that when you sin, it's your fault. Did you hear that? When you sin, it is your fault. When you sin, it's your fault. You choose to sin. Don't blame the people around you or your circumstances for your bad behavior. Who they provoked me. Don't blame them for your lack of self-control. No one kept me accountable. Don't blame others for you lashing out. It's my upbringing. Don't blame others for your moral failure. I didn't get enough support. No, when you sin, it's your fault. You choose to sin. And so church, understand this. We are all personally responsible for our own sin, and we must own it. We must own it. Ananias had every opportunity to confess, to acknowledge his guilt, to repent, but he didn't. And we'll see in a moment, God's judgment fell on him. Wonderful beginning to such ugliness. Overflowing grace, and then so quickly stained by sin and deception. Now, look at verse 5 and verse 6, the judgment. God's response to Ananias is sudden, isn't it? Swift, very dramatic. <laughs> he heard Peter's words, and then he collapsed and died right there. Verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Now, Peter does not speak any words of judgment, does he? He's just unmasked Ananias' sin, deception. It's God's judgment that comes on Ananias, and the punishment for sin is death. And we read that all who heard what had happened, all who saw, were filled with fear. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Later you discover, uh, where we meet Sapphira, uh, that the church is present. The word fear here is not reverent fear because you're in the presence of greatness. It's not awe, right? The word fear here is terror and dread and horror because People are horrified that such a thing could happen to Ananias, who appeared spirit-filled, who appeared generous, who, who appeared empowered by the grace of the gospel. He looked like Barnabas, sincere, devoted, and incredibly generous. But you can't lie to God, can you? You can't deceive God, can you? It could happen to Ananias. And if it could happen to Ananias, it stands to reason it could happen to anyone. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man and a woman will reap what he or she sows. Galatians 6, verse 7. And so Ananias' death confronts the church with the reality that God is a holy God and he will not be mocked, certainly not in his church. Ananias was a Christian fraud. He, he was pretending to be devoted to God and his people, but he was really only there to promote himself, pretending to be holy, but a heart of deception within. And we read here that God saw right through it. And now, why was Ananias judged? I think he was judged as a warning to the people of God, as a warning to this new church community, to not let sin take hold of their church community. Okay? Uh, and so... What happens next? I want you to come with me to verse 7 to verse 11 because it's fascinating because in verse 7 to verse 11, we have another cycle of judgment, of deception and judgment. Okay? Uh, and you discover the same thing actually happens here. Three hours later, Sapphira comes. Peter says that you sell uh, the piece of property for such and such an amount. And then we have another lie, a deception, verse 8, this time on Sapphira's part. And then we, again, verse 9, we have Peter's word followed by judgment in verse 10. Death comes again. See another cycle? She too is complicit. She too conspires. That's what we read, right? Uh, 
And so the sin notice of Ananias and Sapphira is described here in verse 9 as an attempt to do what? Verse 9, to conspire, to test the Spirit of the Lord. Not just a desire for self-promotion and standing in the life of the church, but arrogance as well, because they thought they could get away with it. They thought that God wouldn't do anything about their sin. They thought God wouldn't hold them responsible, that He wouldn't see. And then notice verse 11, great fear seized the whole church. The word there is the gathering, the congregation. Because they've seen this, they've witnessed this. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. God has intervened again in judgment. Again, a warning to His church community not to take their personal sins lightly. God will not be mocked, He says, in this church community. And it is a great sober reminder to us that just because you belong to a church community doesn't mean your sins are hidden from God. Or that you can now ignore them. Or that God will somehow overlook your sin because you appear religious or because you're involved in ministry. It's a sober warning, isn't it? So why is this passage here? What can we learn from this? Well, three things. Uh, have a look at our conclusion. There are three points there. Number one, it's a warning against spiritual deception. Uh, is, it, you know, is it saying, if you don't give all your money to God, He'll strike you dead? Of course not. That's not what it's saying, okay? So get that straight. It is a warning, though, against spiritual deception. It's a warning against playing Christian, a warning against pretend holiness, a warning against deceiving God and His people. God will not be deceived by pretend worship in His church. And, and there is a very clear warning in this passage, isn't there, that God will not tolerate duplicity, pretending to be devoted to God and His people, but really only seeking your own praise. Uh, serving others to make people think you're more godly than you really are. Using your work in ministry not to serve God, but to mask your desire for influence and power. Friends, God will not be mocked. A man and a woman will reap what he or she sows. Hebrews 12, 28, 29 reminds us that we are to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Ah, a fire that cleanses the fires of grace but the fires that also will judge and destroy sin. Got to remember that. Fires of grace and the fires of judgment. And we too are God's church, aren't we? Second thing, the passage here is also not here so that we all go, oh, thank goodness I'm not like Ananias and Sapphira. If that's you, then you've really missed the point of our passage. The passage is a sober warning to us that sin is never far away from us as a church community and is never far from our own personal lives. What we read here is an account of sin that takes place in an amazing church community, a, a, an account that takes place in a church with a great beginning a prayerful church filled with the Holy Spirit, a church united around the gospel, a church where the gospel is being proclaimed boldly, a church where the grace of the gospel is overflowing incredible acts of generosity. You know what? I want that kind of a church. I want us to be more of that kind of a church. But even in a church like that, it is a church that is immediately marked by the ugliness of sin, satanic influence, the desire for self-promotion, the wickedness of deception, a conspiracy of lies. And so... We should never think, right, that, that just because things are going well in a church community, that sin is far from us. No, sin is always knocking at the door of our hearts, our lives, and our church community. And it will often rear its ugly head in our lives. We must be watchful in our lives, not of others, but of ourselves. But of ourselves. We must not presume that God will not judge. We must take our personal sins Seriously, we must not take them lightly as the people of God. Here's the third thing we learn from this passage. Number three, we learn that God is incredibly gracious. He is, because He will not allow deception within, destroy His church, His mission in the book of Acts. You see what He's doing? He intervenes. The death of Ananias and Sapphira isn't just an act of God's judgment on deceitfulness. It's an act of God's grace on His church. He's protecting His church from those who would seek to destroy the church from within. I read this passage, and for the first time I realized that this is 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17, being played out. This is what Paul says about the church as God's temple, where God's Spirit dwells in His people, where God intervenes and destroys those who would seek to divide and destroy His church, His mission. 
That's why you read 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy to him and you together are that temple. God will always protect and he will always preserve his church, not just from the enemy out there, but from the enemy within as well. The false prophet, the false teacher, the wolf in sheep's clothing, the brother or sister who is divisive, those who would seek to deceive God's people and take advantage of God's people within, those who would seek to use God's people within. Friends, God is gracious in judgment. He has and He will continue protecting His church. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank You that Your mission is unstoppable. And this Lord's Day, we want to ask that we might not presume on your grace in our lives and certainly in our church community. Help us read this portion of the Bible with a sense of gratefulness and fear. Help us to be thankful and grateful because you are a God who is gracious and that you seek to, for our community and our church to flourish, to be a church that's filled with your spirit, dependent on you, a church that's boldly proclaiming the good news of Jesus, uh, a, ch a church that's united around the Lord Jesus, and a church overflowing in generosity. But help us remember that sin is never far from any one of us. Help us to be watchful. Help us to be dependent on you. Help us to always be repentant, to take our sins seriously, to not treat them lightly, so that we might actually not be deceitful in the way we relate to others and in the way we relate to you. And we do thank you that even in judgment, you are preserving your church, you are preserving your mission, and that it is unstoppable. And so we come to you with thankfulness, but also repentant hearts. And we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our response song, Take My Life.
So I must confess that when I usually read Acts chapter 5, I'm always flabbergasted at what that passage meant. And I always thought that God was and a nice sense of fear up. But then upon this sermon this morning, sorry for those of you who are tuning in here, that's not what I meant. Uh, I also was just, um, yeah, I was shocked and awestruck by how gracious God is, even in judgment, that he um, has gone that way to purify his church. And so let's continue to reflect on that as we um, hear the sermon. Now, we're also going to be reading the Apostles' Creed together, and it is a brief summary of the teachings of the Apostles as contained in the Gospels. And so we're going to be reading that together. We're going to affirm what we believe here by reading what's expressed in the Apostles' Creed. So let's read it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and our everlasting. Amen. Church, uh, as we bring our time to a close, uh, let me encourage you uh, with God's word of blessing as you leave as God's people to love and serve God's world. And so hear God's word of blessing and, and as I pray for you. Lord of life, we do pray that by the power of your resurrection and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and among us, we pray you will always deliver us from all forms of sin and selfishness and deceitfulness. And bring us the fullness of joy and obedience in following you, our true King and Redeemer. And so, church, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you. The Lord give you peace. Amen. God bless you guys. Masks are not required after church outdoors. Uh, let me encourage you to spend some time in fellowship, uh, saying hello to people. Uh, and if we don't see you at lunch, uh, we will certainly see you next Sunday. God bless you. Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the psalms this one in particular is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Through Christ I pray. Amen.